released by the state government last July, but because of the size of California's welfare population, a decline of 12% reflects a, a staggering number of cases that have vanished from the rolls. Uh, and in Los Angeles County alone, that's something like 25,000 cases, 25,000 families have disappeared from participation in welfare. Now, given the disappearance of families who are participating in the welfare system across the country, with the lone exception of Hawaii, um, people who called for an end to welfare, who President Clinton calling for an end to welfare as we know it, and Republicans uh, calling for a termination of, of all benefits, those folks are pretty impressed uh, with what they have accomplished. They've been enjoying a kind of I told you so kind of moment, just enact this bill and we'll, we'll you know, get rid of, of uh, endless dependency on government for uh, economic assistance. Um, as they uh, enjoy this I told you so sort of moment, however, it is important to step back and examine a lot of worrisome data that um, has been floating around as a result of studies by such groups as the Urban Institute and so forth. Um, for example, one bit of worrisome data uh, actually comes out of the National Conference of State Legislatures, which is a fairly establishment organization since it represents uh, you know, the Kansas legislature, the Illinois legislature, and so forth. In their 1998 report, um, they showed that while 40 to 60 percent of folks who leave welfare obtain some kind of employment, they do so at wages below the poverty line. And wages, the poverty line uh, for a family of three is set at $13,650 uh, $13, a year. So that's a pretty, pretty meager wage for folks who are <coughs> moving off the rolls according to this particular study. And what that suggests is that leaving welfare or the end to welfare is not the same thing as an end to poverty. Um, another piece of worris worrisome data uh, collected by the Government Accounting Office. Uh, their study, which was released in August, found that the mean wages for recipients who leave welfare for employment hover between $5.60 an hour and $6.60 an hour, which means that a year-round full-time job pays an annual income below the poverty line. Again, more evidence that sort of, you know, the, the decline in caseloads does not necessarily mean a decline in poverty. Meanwhile, not all recipients even find jobs, let alone decent wages. A 1998 study of adult recipients in New York City showed that only one-fifth to one-third of recipients who left wel uh, welfare actually found employment. Uh, and then a 1997 study to sort of bring things down <coughs> to the wage level altogether, a uh, study of what kinds of jobs might be available to low-skilled recipients, uh, looked at the Midwest for some of its uh, statistics and found that in the mid Midwest, there are 22 workers for each job that pays at least a poverty wage, meaning at least $13,650 a year for a family of three. That's 22 to one competition, right, for a poverty line job. Um, there are 64 workers for each job that pays 150% of the poverty line, which is about $18,500. Again, so you have a 64 to 1 uh, competition for um, precious uh, work at, um, at uh, very low wages. Um, for jobs that pay a living wage, which for a family of three is defined as $25,907 a year, there are 97 workers for each job. So you have, if you're poor uh, and you have low skills, you have a 97 to 1 chance of, of getting a job that pays a wage that makes it possible for you to sustain a family at a, at a minimal level of existence. So as I suggested, this is fairly worrisome data. For recipients who can find jobs, the problem is not just that wages are low, it's also that child care and health care and transportation are so expensive. So although many welfare recipients have moved into some form of employment, uh, they often cannot really afford to be employed. This is particularly true where recipients are parenting alone 
uh, because they are the sole guardian of their children's welfare. And if a single mother's job doesn't cover health care, she has to pay for it. If her kids aren't in school and she works odd hours, she has to pay for child care. If her job isn't nearby, she has to buy a car or pay for public transportation. So say she earns the minimum wage in a full-time job, which would bring her income to about $11,000 a year, which is below the poverty line, by the way. After she pays for the services that she and her children need so she can go to work, there's very little left over to pay for other basics like food and shelter and clothing. Given these kinds of economic data, these sort of testimonials to, to the uh, intensity and durability of poverty, poor single mothers are understandably under a fairly unique economic duress and have fairly unique needs for, for welfare. Yet it is poor single mothers whose access to welfare is most severely curtailed by the new welfare law. The new welfare law, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996, terminated poor single mothers' entitlement to receive income assistance and gave state governments the prerogative to decide which mothers may get welfare benefits at all and under what conditions. The law also tells states how to regulate the behaviors and decisions of the mothers they permit to receive welfare. The welfare system set up by the Personal Responsibility Act regards poor single mothers' need for welfare as morally suspect and sets up a host of rules and incentives and punishments to elicit righteous behavior from women who uh, are poor. The core message of the PRA is that these mothers should get married. The law tells mothers who are not married, it does so through a system of incentives and disincentives, the law tells mothers who are not married to act like they're married by defending, depending on child support, meaning restoring the financial headship of the, of the man in the family. The law tells mothers who are not married not to have more kids, family cap mechanisms, illegitimacy ratios, and things of that sort. And the law tells mothers who are not married to work full time outside the home, even if doing so means leaving their children without quality care. Now, the law does not actually require poor single mothers to marry, but it creates, as I said, powerful incentives to do so. For example, work requirements that we hear talked about all the time are conditioned on marital status. Where there are two parents in a heterosexual nuclear marital household, where there are two parents, one parent may stay at home to care for children under the law. But where there's only one parent, she must leave her home and her children to work for wages. This means that if a poor single mother can't find reliable childcare or wants to raise her own children, if she needs to or wants to work inside the home, she would be well advised to get married. Work requirements are a kind of punishment, in effect, for staying unmarried. The requirement that mothers cooperate in getting child support from biological fathers, which is the second pillar of the welfare law, is another kind of punishment for not being married. What the new law means by personal responsibility, then, is not personal responsibility at all. The Personal Responsibility Act makes government responsible for how poor mothers lead their lives. Under the act, Government tells poor single mothers with whom to associate, under what conditions to have and raise children, and what kind of work is appropriate. These instructions invade poor single mothers' freedom of association and freedom of vocation. They curtail their fundamental rights, and by fundamental rights I'm referring to constitutional rights, to sexual privacy, and to making parenting decisions about their own children. Association, vocation, privacy, and parenting are basic guarantees of the Constitution, according to the Supreme Court. And these guarantees are guarded strictly for everyone, everyone except mothers who need welfare. The Personal Responsibility Act 
in effect, sets up a welfare police state with poor single mothers as its subject. The welfare police state governs poor single mothers as a separate caste, and this is the central aspect of the way in which the welfare policy is a citizenship law. It, sets, it, it governs poor single mothers as a separate caste, subject to separate rules and distinguished from the basic guarantees of citizenship that are protected and promised to all others. The provisions that subordinate poor single mothers as women and as citizens come in two fundamental sets in the, in the policy. The first set includes the fairly familiar work requirements and time limits. And the second set includes what, are, what is referred to as mandatory maternal cooperation in the establishment of paternity and child support. Let me say something first about work requirements and time limits. Everybody who works outside the home may feel that she has to work, uh, but has to for most people is a matter of necessity, uh, not of law. Work requirements and time limits create a legal obligation for poor single mothers and only for poor single mothers to work outside the home. If they don't do community service work, work fair, Within two months of getting on welfare, they can lose their benefits. That means they're being compelled by law to work outside the home. In being compelled to work outside the home, poor single mothers are robbed of vocational freedom. That is, the freedom to choose whether to work inside or outside the home, whether to work as caregivers for their own children or labor market participants and they are robbed of the vocational freedom to choose whether or not to accept low-wage employment under oppressive working conditions, which is a choice that is available to everyone else. The second sort of set of intrusions has to do, as I said, with paternity establishment and child support. Most people who are parenting alone want the other parent to contribute, at least financially, to the care of children. Government assists many custodial parents who want financial contributions from absent parents uh, in actually getting those contributions. It actually doesn't do a good enough job at that. But, however, government's child support enforcement mechanisms for most people uh, does, does not include compulsion. Um, it does not compel most custodial parents to seek child support from absent parents, uh, usually fathers. As long as she does not need welfare, a single mother may decide for herself whether she wants child support. But in contrast, single mothers who need welfare are forced by the Personal Responsibility Act to help the government get child support, support that goes to government, not to mothers. In order to determine who uh, owes child support, mothers must help, help the government identify fathers. Where a mother has been married, this doesn't involve too much, because paternity is a matter of public record, because the law assumes that a husband is his wife's child's father, uh, even if biologically speaking he is not. But where a mother has not been married, it means having to tell some government official about her sex life. That's what the establishment of paternity is all about. It means telling a judge or a welfare official or a child support enforcement official, um, answering questions about the circumstances, circumstances under which she conceived her child. It also means involving some man in a parental relationship that a mother may never have anticipated or desired, and that may be quite dangerous to the mother and her children. And it robs the woman of the freedom to make those determinations uh, on the basis of her own interests and on the basis of her own best knowledge of the situation in which her family exists. In these ways, poor non-marital mothers are thus robbed of associational freedom, yet another highly protected constitutional value, not to mention their rights to privacy and safety. Well, Given all these ways in which the rights of poor single mothers have been injured by welfare reform, given these political consequences, it's worth wondering what feminists have to say about this. 
since feminists, after all, are the leading political force in defense of rights for, for women. The Personal Responsibility Act is the most sweeping assault uh, on women's rights in this century. It actually takes rights away. But during the welfare debate, the assault on poor single mothers' rights received very little attention, even from feminists. For anyone concerned about gender equality or welfare justice, as I am, um, you have to wonder what sort of underpinned the feminist politics of welfare reform. Punitive welfare reform was not accomplished by one political party or by one side of the ideological spectrum. Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, patriarchalists and feminists were in consensus about basic elements of reform. The breadth and depth of that consensus makes it hard to imagine reversing welfare reform in the near future. But the only way I can see to recover the welfare entitlement for poor single mothers and to undo uh, much of the damage in constitutional terms is to try to break that consensus. And one way to break that consensus is to show how a right to welfare, a right to income support, uh, socially provided income support is intr intrinsic to the feminist goal uh, of equality for all women. So let me proceed briefly with an analysis of how and why feminists forgot their goal, that is, the goal of equality for all women. Um, and that will lead me then to uh, try to imagine how we might rethink welfare, uh, indeed how all of us who care about civil rights and economic equity might go about reforming welfare reform. First, though, I need to clarify who I mean by feminists. I do not, for the most part, mean national women's and feminist organizations. Uh, groups like the American Association for University Women, for example, or the National Organization for Women, or the YWCA. Most of those groups, most of those national groups with Washington offices um, actually came together to fight uh, punitive welfare initiatives. Uh, they came together in a group called the Council of Presidents, meaning the Council of Presidents of each of the women's organizations that had national representation. And they were quite active. They called press conferences, they participated in vigils, um, they appealed to their memberships for support, for letters to Congress members, and things of that sort. Um, some leaders uh, of, of the sort of organized feminist movement, like Patricia Ireland, for example, who's president of NOW, uh, even engaged in dramatic acts of civil disobedience, going on a hunger strike, chaining yourself to the White House fence, uh, and whatnot. Other nationally visible feminists, including Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan, joined a group of scholars and activists that I co-chaired. Uh, our name was the Women's Committee of 100. Uh, and we mobilized this group for the sole purpose of fighting uh, the personal responsibility uh, acts, attacks on, on poor women. So while I, as you will see, I will have strong words to say about most feminists, I don't really mean to suggest that there were no feminist voices raised against punitive reform. Uh, but I, what I will say adamantly uh, on the basis of my experience in the political trenches was that those voices were relatively few. And as a result of the, the low number of feminist voices participating uh, on the side of poor women, we ended up with very little of an antidote in public debate to the kind of rhetoric and mythology that made punitive uh, policies possible. Uh, in the Women's Committee of 100, for example, we tried very hard to mobilize rank and file feminists across the country against uh, the Republican uh, policy proposal. But the millions of women who have made feminism a movement, showing up at marches and, and, and uh, campaigning for the Equal Rights Amendment and, and so forth, were either indifferent or hostile to our pleas. The Personal Responsibility Act seriously harms women's rights, yet most feminists did very little to resist it. Many feminists actually endorsed the law's core principles, 
namely that poor single mothers should move from welfare to work and into financial relationships with their children's fathers. Sometimes by their silence and sometimes in their deeds, many feminists actually collaborated with punitive welfare reformers. Now, the feminists I'm talking about here uh, include the rank and file across the country who wouldn't mobilize in defense of poor mothers. Um, and those feminists are, are folks who are primarily middle class and primarily white with strong ties to the organized movement through such organizations as NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, the National Organization for Women, Emily's List, and so forth. Folks that contribute through local chapters um, to, the, to the kind of organized component of the women's movement. In addition to those folks uh, who supply constituent pressures, after all, on the people who enact public policy, um, we also had feminists who occupy fairly high positions in government who were, were uh, in, a, in a position to actually make a difference in the welfare debate, but who elected not to. Um, one of those feminists is a cabinet secretary, Donna Shalala of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, several are members of Congress, Nita Lowy, uh, Patricia Schroeder at the time, um, folks like that. Now, although feminism has many iterations and there are lots of different organized feminist groups uh, throughout the country, uh, the, particularly the kind of official feminists, the people in, in high government positions and in, in Congress often are regarded as speaking for all of feminism. And so their role was particularly critical. Um, uh, their role in defense of welfare reform was particularly critical for the fate of the welfare policy uh, in its treatment of, of poor mothers. When um, mobilized, um, these high profile feminists can wield very impressive political clout. Um, helping to create gender gaps in election, the year of, of the woman in 1992, saving abortion rights, um, for example, even at, uh, at uh, the risk of, of their own political survival. But when it came to welfare, for the most part, they sat on their hands, ignoring appeals from sister feminists, and especially from poor mothers and welfare rights activists, to defend welfare as a women's issue, uh, and to oppose the war against poor women as though it were a war against all women. Many uh, even entered the, the war on the anti-welfare, anti-woman side. Some examples, on Capitol Hill, all white women in the United States Senate, including four Democratic women who call themselves feminists, Barbara Mikulski, Barbara Boxer, Patty Murray, Diane Feinstein voted for the new welfare law when it first came to the Senate floor in the summer of 1995. They voted for the Republican bill that ended the entitlement, gave block grants to the states, included family caps, and all kinds of punitive measures uh, that would adversely affect the uh, political and economic status of poor single mothers and their families. Uh, in the House of Representatives in 1996, 26 of 31 Democratic women, all of whom consider themselves feminists, voted for a Democratic welfare substitute bill that accomplished the same thing that the Republican bill did, i.e. ended the entitlement to welfare and subjected recipients to all kinds of work requirements and paternity establishment requirements and so forth, thus kind of sealing the consensus uh, behind uh, the punitive thrust of, of welfare reform. Another kind of example comes from uh, initiatives at the grassroots level. Uh, the National Organization for Women Legal Defense and Education Fund, which litigates all kinds of women's rights issues, um, issued an appeal uh, to its members and to women in listservs and so forth across the country, uh, an appeal for funds to support hiring an economic justice litigator over the long haul. And that appeal for funds elicited so much hate mail uh, from <coughs> women across the country that now LDEF decided to just drop the welfare issue uh, and not do any more direct email or, or snail mail mailings on welfare because uh, of, the, of the lack of support uh, in its own kind of organized constituency. 
Now, feminist members of Congress did not write the Personal Responsibility Act, obviously, um, nor did members of the National Organization for Women um, or contributors to Emily's List from across the country uh, comprise the driving force behind the most brutal uh, provisions of the new law. My claim is not really that feminists were uniquely responsible for how welfare has been reformed. Um, my point really is that they were uniquely positioned to make a difference. We were uniquely positioned to make a difference. Um, we have made a difference in many, many arenas across the years, even during inauspicious Republican presidency. So there was no reason to not try to make a difference uh, in an inauspicious Republican Congress. Um, for example, uh, feminists were able to undo very destructive Supreme Court decisions during the Reagan-Bush era, uh, getting, winning the Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1998, 1988, for example, uh, and winning passage in 1991 of the Civil Rights Act that amended the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which not only restored sort of some of the basic um, protections of the 64 Act, but actually expanded protections for women. In the you know, heyday of the George Bush presidency, uh, feminists were able to win uh, the right for women to, or men to secure damages in sex discrimination cases, something that had not been possible uh, before that time. So feminists know how to make a difference. They know how to intervene in hostile political terrain. Uh, and they certainly could have made a difference under a friendly democratic president, even though the Republicans were in control of the legislative branch. Of course, feminists couldn't have changed uh, Republican intentions in the 104th Congress. They couldn't have changed Newt Gingrich's mind. But they surely could have pressured the Democrat they helped elect to the White House to veto the Republican bill. Remember, the presidential veto is a very powerful weapon. Now, President Clinton did veto the Republican bill twice, but ultimately he signed it. And ultimately, uh, your poor single mother is, after all, what counts. Welfare reform did not bear directly on the lives of most middle class feminists and did not directly implicate their rights. And I think that was a big part of the problem. The new welfare law, the provisions of the Personal Responsibility Act, did not threaten middle class women's reproductive choices or their sexual privacy, or their right to raise their own children, or their occupational freedom. So they did not raise their voices as they might have, say, if abortion rights had been at stake. This gave the green light to feminists in Congress, including Barbara Boxer from my own state of California, to treat welfare reform as basically unimportant as a women's issue. No self-identified feminist in Congress would dare to vote against an issue that has been identified as an important women's issue. No self-identified feminist in Congress, for example, would dare to vote um, uh, to ban late-term abortions, even though it's politically unpopular. Um, but most of them eagerly voted to tear the social safety net out from under poor single mothers, because neither feminist constituencies from across the country uh, the voters who make up the gender gap, nor the general public comprehended the ways in which the welfare initiative was very much a women's issue and went to the heart of women's citizenship and the equality not only of women vis-a-vis -vis men, but of equality among women in our society. Silence was not uh, the only problem, however. Silence among feminists or disinterest in welfare as, a, as an issue that was particularly significant for women. At the same time, feminists were silent about the effects of new welfare provisions on poor women's rights. They were quite vocal about the need to reform welfare so as to improve the personal and family choices that poor single mothers make. When feminists did talk about welfare as sort of a women's issue, it often seemed like they were more concerned with reconciling welfare with feminism than with defending poor single, right, poor single mother's right to receive welfare. Many feminists shared assumptions of welfare reformers, uh, most importantly that welfare has promoted single mother's dependency on government rather than independence in the labor market, that it has discouraged poor women from practicing fertility control, 
uh, and that it has compensated for the sexual and paternal irresponsibility of individual men. Without a doubt, uh, welfare has never been very nice to women, uh, or congruent, really, with feminism. Its goal has never been to enhance women's independence or to honor the full range of choices women need to consider and to make. Benefits, welfare benefits, historically, since welfare was first invented in the early part of this century as a state-level obligation, have always been conditional and stigmatized, forcing poor mothers to conform to government's rules and to suffer suspicion that they cheat on those rules. Um, but critiques of social control are not really what lay behind most uh, sort of feminist reservations about defending poor women's right uh, to welfare. During the welfare debate, most feminists, like most non-feminists, focused on the deficiencies of welfare mothers rather than on the deficiencies of the welfare system. They trafficked in the tropes that everybody else trafficked in, illegitimacy, pathology, dependency, irresponsibility, almost as much as did conservative male politicians in both parties. And you can go to press conferences that were convened, you can look at the congressional debates and so forth, to track precisely the deployment of that language on the progressive side of the political spectrum. But kinder and gentler, really, than the men who repealed welfare Feminists viewed mothers who need welfare as women who need feminism, not punishment. And so they were far less inclined to want to be bu brutally punitive than the ultimate law actually was. They saw welfare mothers as victims, maybe of patriarchy, maybe of racism, uh, possibly of false consciousness. However, they didn't see welfare mothers as agents of their own lives, as women who are entitled to and capable of making independent and honorable choices about what kind of work they will do and how many children they will have and whether they will marry. If anything, many feminists agreed with conservatives that welfare mothers do not make good choices. Feminist reservations about welfare mothers' choices strengthened the bipartisan consensus that there's something wrong with mothers who need welfare and that cash assistance should be a mechanism for reforming such mothers. The two pillars of the new welfare law, work and marriage, were born from this consensus. The harshness of the law's work requirements and the brutality of its sanctions against non-marital childbearing may be Republican and patriarchal in execution. But the law's emphasis on women's labor market participation and on men's participation in families were democratic and feminist in inspiration. Let me explain how. Feminists contributed to the new welfare regime in two major ways. First, in their emphasis on work outside the home as a source of women's liberation. And second, in their insistence on, quote unquote, making fathers pay. Feminists have long fought for women's right to work outside the home. Over the years, our bias has favored outside work. We've even been a little suspicious of the woman who works inside the home as if by doing caregiving work full time, she somehow undermines feminism and women's rights. Often we have demeaned such women as just a housewife. The feminist work ethic, by which I mean labor market participation ethic, made sense for the white and middle class women who rekindled feminism in the 1960s. They politicized their own lived experiences, experiences that enforced their inequality. Heading the list of oppressive experiences for white and middle class women was the ideology of domesticity, which had confined middle class women to the home and had ensured their economic dependence on fathers and husbands for generations and, and, and even for centuries. Middle class feminists then understandably keyed on work outside the home as the alternative to domesticity and therefore as the defining element of women's full and equal citizenship, as the defining element really of women's civil rights. As we entered the labor market in ever larger numbers during the 1970s and 1980s, women did not abandon caregiving work. Rather, we found our energy doubly taxed by the dual responsibility now of earning 
and giving care uh, in the family. Accordingly, by the 1980s, many feminists began to call for labor market policies that address the caregiving responsibilities that fall disproportionately on women, especially caring for children. The concern has been that caregiving obligations impede women's opportunities and achievements in the labor market. Following this, feminists have sought labor policies that relieve women of their family responsibilities so that they may participate equally uh, in work outside the home, and has, heavy emphasis has been placed on such policies as childcare, for example. Um, we have been far less interested, uh, in general, in winning social policies that support women where we do our caregiving work, namely in the family. We have not focused so much on how wage work impedes caregiving work. We have focused on how caregiving impedes wage work. The idea that the labor market is potentially liberating for women historically has divided feminists along class and race lines. Women of color and poor white women have not usually found wage labor to be a source of equality. To the contrary, especially for women of color. Wage work has been a source of oppression and a mark of inequality. Wage work by women of color has been imposed on them or expected of them by white society, though white society would not impose or expect wage work of its own women. It has been necessary for women of color because often their male kin cannot find jobs at living wages if they can find jobs at all. And it has been exploitative because women of color earn disproportionately low wages. Since women of color have always worked outside their own homes, often raising other people's children, the right to care for their own children, to work inside their own homes, has been a touchstone goal of women of color's struggles for equality. Women have different relationships to wage work and caregiving work and different ways of defining the relationship between those both kinds of work uh, in, in our struggles for equality. Um, and because of that, differences should feed multiple approaches to the problems of women's inequality and the definitions and prescriptions for women's civil rights. Unfortunately, though, second wave feminism, the women's movement that emerged in the late 60s and continues with us today, gave a fairly monolithic emphasis to, to winning rights in the workplace at the expense of winning the right to give care to one's own family. And this was accompanied, with sort of a mutter, by a feminist expectation that all women ought to work outside the home, that a self-respecting woman who believes in rights ought to work outside the home, and an assumption that any job outside the home, including caring for other people's children, is more socially productive than caring for your own. Although feminism is fundamentally about winning women, women choices, our labor market bias has put much of feminism not on the side of vocational choice for all women, on the choice to work inside or outside the home, but on the side of wage earning for all women. And in the new welfare law, we reap the consequences because what the new welfare law does is say that the feminist right to work outside the home is poor single mother's obligation to do so. <coughs> the labor market focus of second wave feminism has accomplished much for women, most importantly establishing equality claims for women as wage earners. Contemporary feminist calls for further labor market reforms, for an increased minimum wage, for example, for comparable worth, for child care, rightly point out the persisting impediments to women's equality in the labor market. The problem is not with the specific content of those calls for policy innovation. The problem is with the one-sidedness and prescriptivity of, of the feminist agenda. Many feminists have worked ardently to attenuate the new welfare law's harshest provisions. For example, feminists have been pursuing the family violence option, trying to get states to adopt it. 
uh, feminists in Congress have been working to secure a greater investment in vocational education uh, programs and so forth. Uh, and feminists at the grassroots level have been working in coalition with welfare activists and welfare recipients to try to make sure that the Fair Labor Standards Act is enforced so that women who are forced into work fair projects and so forth get the minimum wage or protected by sexual harassment laws and so forth. So we do have sort of considerable feminist investment now under the new regime in trying to make things less bad for poor single mothers who need welfare. If successful, all of these efforts could improve some women's fate uh, in the new welfare system. But they don't disturb the principles behind the new law. They don't refute the idea that poor single mothers should seek work outside the home. They, except among welfare rights activists and a handful of feminists, no one has really risen to defend poor mothers' right to raise their own children, and no one has questioned the proposition that poor single mothers should have to, should be compelled by law to work outside the home. Nor has anyone really paid serious attention to the racial effects of welfare principles. Although work requirements aim indiscriminately at all poor single mothers, it is mothers of color who bear their heaviest weight. African American and Latina mothers are disproportionately poor and accordingly are disproportionately enrolled in welfare. And if the New York Times is correct, uh, as, the, as the roles decline, the women of color presence on the roles increase, is increasing as a proportion because the people who are finding jobs uh, are white mothers who have been enrolled in welfare. To give you a sense of the, of the, of the potential racialized effects of these um, biases in the law, in 1994, uh, according to the Green Book, which is the House Ways and Means Committee uh, staff study of, of data about welfare, AFDC families are almost two-thirds of color, 37.4% uh, white, uh, and everybody else was a woman of color, 36.4 African American, 19.9% Latina, 3% Asian, and 1.3% Native American. What that means, and why I draw your attention to those numbers, is that when welfare rules indenture poor single mothers as unpaid servants of local governments and workfare programs, it is mothers of color who are disproportionately harmed. So we have a racial civil rights as well as a gender civil rights problem clearly on our hands. And when time limits require poor mothers to forsake their children for the labor market, it is mothers of color who are disproportionately deprived of their right to manage their own families' lives, and it is children of color who are disproportionately deprived of their mother's care. Second way in which feminists have influenced the emergence of this racially discriminatory welfare police state. The um, idea that wage work is good for women, that the labor market is liberate, liberating, mask the toll of work requirements on caregiving, um, especially for mothers who are, are poor and of color. The, I, the other feminist idea, that tough child support uh, is good for mothers and children, raise the costs, the hurdles to childbearing and child raising for mothers who are poor and never married. Feminists in Congress um, played a particular role in, in this regard. They have been particularly emphatic about, quote unquote, making fathers pay for children through increased federal involvement in the establishment and enforcement of child support orders. In fact, um, without the interventions of feminists in Congress, uh, especially in the House of Representatives, paternity-based child support would not even be a pillar of the new welfare law that it has become. They were the ones who insisted on, uh, on uh, uh, including it in the Republican initiative. The child support provisions that feminists designed and Republicans tolerated, um, although they enjoy them now, uh, impose stringent national conditions on non-marital child-rearing by poor women, that is to say, on, on a non-unmarried mother's raising of her own kids. The first condition, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, is the mandatory establishment of paternity. Welfare law says that a mother's eligibility for welfare depends upon her willingness to reveal the identity of her child's father. 
since the purpose of a paternity establishment is to assign child support obligations to biological fathers, the second condition is that mothers who need welfare must cooperate in establishing, modifying, and enforcing support orders for their children. The law requires states to reduce a family's welfare grant by at least 25% if a mother fails to comply with these requirements, and it permits states to, to, to deny the family a welfare grant altogether uh, if, a, if a mother fails to comply with these requirements. All of this has to do with the deadbeat dad thesis um, that has been very popular in women's political circles for the past number of years. Uh, the deadbeat that dad thesis, as it plays out in welfare politics, is basically um, the idea that mothers are poor because fathers are derelict. And it's an idea that's quite popular among middle class feminists, as it is among the general pub, uh, public. Finding the costs of uh, childbearing that fall disproportionately on women, um, a wellspring of gender inequality, Many feminists want men to provide for their biological children, even if they have no relationship with them. In cautious pursuit of this objective, align many middle class feminists behind a policy that endangers the rights of poor single mothers. Paternity establishment rules compel non-marital mothers, unmarried mothers, to disclose private matters in exchange for cash and medical assistance. They can't even get Medicaid unless they do this. Um, they have to answer questions that are posed to them like, who did you sleep with, how often, when, where, how. Meanwhile, child support rules require non-marital mothers to associate with biological fathers and in so doing to give those fathers uh, a claim to parental rights because by assigning a biological role uh, uh, and giving, giving government the right to declare the biological father the father of children, that makes it possible for the man to go to court to take the children away from the mother uh, if that's what he wishes to do. In these and other ways, paternity establishment and child support provisions set poor single mothers apart from other mothers, subjecting them to stringent legal requirements because of their class and marital status. Again, we have an inequity problem that's tied to the social position of the mother. Now, many of these provisions offer services to middle-class mothers that middle-class mothers may elect to use, um, hiring registries, interstate enforcement mechanisms, and so forth. These same services that middle-class mothers may elect to use are imposed upon mothers at, in exchange for a welfare benefit. Middle-class feminist interest in vigorous child support enforcement is part of a feminist vision of gender justice. According to this vision, men ought to be held responsible for the procreative consequences of their access to women's bodies. The quest for fairness in procreative relations drives the increasingly punitive proposals designed to force fathers to meet their obligations to children. But it doesn't explain, it explains why we have an increasing drive to force fathers to do certain things, but it doesn't explain why middle class feminists think that forcing mothers to permit and invite fathers into families is an acceptable way of making fathers responsible. We can look at congressional debates about, child, about welfare and child support for some clues. What the debates show is that most feminist legislators didn't really notice that child support provisions are coercive for poor, never married mothers. When they spoke about child support, they either referred to their own class and marital experiences or to the experiences of women like them, their sisters, their neighbors down the street, and so forth. And when middle class women think of circumstances that might lead them to welfare, they think of divorce from the middle class men who might have considerable financial resources to share with children. California Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey is a case in point. She was something of a beltway icon during the welfare debate, and she described herself as a typical welfare mother. 30 years earlier, um, she had had to turn to welfare following her divorce from a man she describes as very successful. And although she had a child support order, she never received a penny from him in child support. So she had to turn to welfare. Despite this, she built a successful career and ultimately was elected to Congress and was situated in Congress in time to participate in this welfare debate. 
Now, her story was an important one because it provided a useful strategic intervention in the welfare debate, countering the stereotypic uh, image of welfare mothers as black and unmarried. But her story, however uplifting, um, is not representative of most mothers who need welfare and certainly not representative of most mothers uh, who, uh, whose uh, biological fathers of their children are not in, in relation to them. Treating her story, the story of a middle class divorced mother who, who would have benefited from her physician husband's child support payments, treating that as representative permitted feminists in Congress to either miss or ignore the very serious ways in which child support and paternity provisions in the welfare law sacrifice poor single mothers' rights. The compulsory features of paternity establishment and child support enforcement may be unremarkable to a divorced mo mother with a support order because she completely escapes compulsion. Um, what matters to her, since she's chosen child support, is that the support order be enforced. But some mothers do not have support orders because they don't want them. A mother may not want to identify her child's father because she may fear abuse for herself or her child. She may not, she may want to, uh, may not want to seek child support because she has chosen to parent alone or with someone else. She may know her child's father is poor and may fear exposing him to the punitive uh, interventions of government, such as being forced into mandatory work programs if he can't pay up uh, the benefit the government says he owes. Or she may just decide that the emotional support from a very poor man, who is the father of her child, is worth more to her than the dollar support that the government might be able to extract under these uh, sorts of, of, of programs. So making fathers pay um, may promote the economic injustice interests of some custodial mothers, but making mothers make fathers pay, which is what is accomplished with respect to poor women in the welfare law, me means making mothers pay for subsistence with their own rights, and in many cases with their safety, because serious domestic violence issues may be at stake. Now, the issue is not whether government should assist mothers in collecting payments from fathers, because of course it should. And neither is the issue whether child support enforcement provisions in welfare policy helps mothers who have or desire child support awards, because of course they do. Um, nor is the, the issue really whether it's a good thing for, for children to have active fathers, because of course that can be. The issue is coercion, coercion directed toward the mother who doesn't conform to patriarchal conventions, um, and it is coercion towards a mother who is being stigmatized as deviant and being punished for her deviance by a withdrawal of her rights. Paternity establishment and child support enforcement became strategies for welfare reform, not because of the unjust effects on, of divorce on mothers, but because of the allegedly unsavory behavior of mothers of non-marital children. It is, it, it, is a, it is a consequence of the politics of illegitimacy. It is non-marital childbearing, illegitimacy, not divorce, that has been blamed for social pathologies like crime and dependency, which is part of the rhetoric, of course, that helped to juice up the, the, uh, the politics of welfare reform. The preamble to the new law legislates precisely this, this point of view. Um, this sort of reasoning leaches into racial argument um, as welfare discourse specifically correlates non-marital childbearing rates among African Americans with social and moral decay. Like work requirements, the coercive aspects of paternity establishment and child support policy are aimed against single mothers in general. However, like work requirements, they have decidedly racial effects. The mandatory maternal cooperation rule targets mothers who are not and have not been married, as well, well as mothers who do not have and do not want child support. Non-marital mothers are the bullseye. Unmarried single mothers are the bullseye. And among non-marital mothers receiving welfare, only 28.4% are white. This means that the new welfare law's invasions of associational and privacy rights will disproportionately harm mothers of color. 
inspired by white feminist outrage against middle-class ex-husbands, paternity establishment and child support provisions both reflect and entrench inequalities among women. So, what can we do now for poor mothers who need welfare? A big part of that answer lies at the local level, cities like Manhattan, Kansas, across the country, in struggles uh, to secure recipients' rights to fair labor standards, accessible child care, access to education, uh, and things like that. But another part of the answer takes us to the courts where we need to defend recipients' basic rights against the notion that you give up rights when you get welfare. In this context, we need to defend reproductive rights, particularly the right not only to uh, choose to not have children, but the right to have children and the right to raise one's own children. And in that connection, we also need to defend basic family rights, associational rights, and vocational freedoms. But we also, as I suggested at the beginning, need to make a case for welfare as a civil right. Uh, we need to make a case for the right to welfare as a condition of both racial and gender equality. We did indeed need to end welfare, but as poor single mothers knew it, not as middle class moralizers imagined it. And why we end welfare, from whose point of view we end welfare, dictates how we end it, and whether we end it by subordinating people, by taking away their rights, or by improving their economic security and their prospects for equality. So what kind of social policy would enable poor single mothers equality and income security? During the welfare debate, feminists who did mobilize against punitive reforms found common ground in opposition to the initiatives proposed by Republicans as well as to some proposed by President Clinton. But we were far from united behind a common vision of welfare justice. While we could all agree on the urgency of child care and health care and jobs and job training, we were far less certain about what social policy should say to single mothers and who, uh, who want to or need to care for their own children in their own homes. That we were collectively ambivalent during the welfare debate about social policy toward caregiving didn't matter too much uh, because the terms of the debate were so narrow. No one was act asking who should welfare be for or how might welfare improve women's lives or questions like that. It doesn't look like those questions are soon going to be asked, um, but if we want those questions to be asked, we need to prepare for the day when they will be. And so toward that end, and by way of conclusion, I will offer my own assessment um, of what we might uh, envision as a just welfare policy. In my view, welfare is not only a survival issue for poor families, it is an equality issue, as I've tried to say, for poor mothers. It is an equality issue because the assumptions and prescriptions embedded in the welfare law and rife in the welfare debate have disabled poor single mothers' constitutional rights and independent personhood. Equality requires us to repudiate the existing basis of welfare, which we can do most effectively by establishing a new basis for welfare. What I would propose is that the new basis of welfare should be that poor single women who give care to their children are mothers whose caregiving is work. We all know that caregiving work, household management and parenting, takes skill, energy, time, responsibility. We know this because people who can afford it pay other people to do this work. Many wage-earning mothers pay for childcare. Upper-class mothers who work outside the home pay for nannies. Very wealthy mothers who don't even work outside the home pay for household workers to assist them with their various tasks. Moreover, even when we're not paying surrogates to do our family caregiving, we pay people to perform activities in the labor market that caregivers also do in the home. We pay drivers to take us places. We pay nurses to make us feel better and help us get well. We pay psychologists to help us with our troubles. We pay teachers to explain our lessons. 
We pay cooks and waitresses to prepare and serve our food. If economists can measure the value of those forms of work when it is performed for other people's families, why can't we impute value to it when it is performed for one's own? In 1972, economists at the Chase Manhattan Bank did just that, translating family caregiving work into its labor market components, nursemaid, dietitian, laundress, maintenance man, chauffeur, food buyer, cook, dishwasher, seamstress, laundress, practical nurse, and gardener. Those were the components that the Chase Manhattan Bank economists came up with. And they concluded that the value of family caregivers' work was at least $13,391 a year in 1972 dollars, which is considerably above the poverty line. Once we establish that all caregiving is work, and that all work has economic value, whatever the racial, marital, or class status of the caregiver and whether or not it is performed in the labor market, we can build a case for economic arrangements that enable poor single mothers to do their jobs. In place of stingy benefits doled out begrudgingly to needy mothers, welfare would become an income owed to non-market caregiving workers, owed as a matter of right to anyone who bears sole responsibility for children or for other dependent family members. This would not, preposterous though it sounds, require a radical restructuring of social policy or an unprecedented departure from past practice. We have something called the survivor's insurance system, which has been around since 1939. And the survivor's insurance system does for widowed parents and their minor children exactly what I'm calling for for poor single mothers. Survivor's insurance is, a, is an element of the Social Security Act. It is an entitlement. It doesn't involve stigma, and it involves no social control. Mothers who are eligible for survivor's insurance do not have to submit to governmental scrutiny in order to receive benefits. They do not have to live by government's moral and cultural rules. They do not have to subscribe to work requirements. There is no time limit other than the age of the children. Benefits are nationally uniform. They are paid out automatically, just like old age pensions are paid out automatically um, uh, by the national government. Every adult who gets survivor's insurance is a single parent. The only difference between a survivor's insurance parent and a welfare parent is that the former was married. Because she was once married to her children's father, a survivor's insurance mother is not required to work outside the home, though she may take a job and still receive benefits. Because she was once married to her children's father, a survivor's insurance mother gets to make her own choices about caregiving and wage earning. Survivor's insurance says that for once married mothers, at least, Caregiving is socially necessary and a valuable activity deserving of social assistance. In my view, if widowed mothers are entitled to public benefits, poor single mothers should be too. In fact, all family caregivers are owed an income in theory for all caregiving is work. However, a caregiver's income should redistribute resources to mothers without means for their capacity to sustain families and to make independent choices hangs on their ability to provide. The cardinal purpose of such an income should be to redress the unique inequality of solo caregivers, usually mothers, who shoulder the dual responsibilities of providing care for children and financing it. While some single mothers may be able to afford both responsibilities, most cannot because they are time poor, cash poor, uh, or both. A caregiver's income would relieve the disproportionate burdens that fall on single mothers, and in so doing would lessen inequalities among women based on class and marital status, and between male and female parents based on default social roles. But although paid to single caregivers only, this income support should be universally guaranteed, assuring a safety net to all caregivers if ever they need to choose to parent or to care for other family members alone. The extension of the safety net to caregivers as independent citizens would promote equality as it would enable adults to make independent choices, including the choice to exit untenable 
relationships of economic dependency and to retain reproductive and family and vocational choices when they do. We need to end welfare in this way to enable equality, to achieve civil rights for poor women, equality in the safety net, rights between the genders among women and under the Constitution. Income support for all caregivers who are going it alone would permit solo parents to decide how best to manage their own family responsibilities. It might even undermine the sexual division of labor for some men may be enticed to do family caregiving work once they realize that it has tangible economic value. Offering an income to all solo caregivers in a unitary system also would erase invidious moral distinctions among mothers, moral distinctions that usually have invidious racial effects. Finally, universal income support for single parents would restore mothers' constitutional rights to not marry, to bear children, to parent them, even if they are poor. It would promote occupational freedom by rewarding this work even when it cannot be exchanged for wages. So redefined, welfare would become a sign of, not of dependency, but of independence, a means not to moral regulation, but to social and political equality. Ending welfare in this way will remedy inequality where it is most gendered and most highly racialized in the caregiving relations of social reproduction. It will not, of course, be enough to end welfare by replacing it with a caregiver's income because the, the end of welfare must be to enhance women's choices on both sides of the work divide. And that means we need to improve the labor market so that it is friendlier to women, so women do in fact have a full choice to decide whether or not to work inside or outside the home. And in order to make the labor market friendlier to women, of course, we're going to have to vigorously pursue anti-discrimination laws, fair labor standard laws, and all of those things that historically have been associated with movements for economic rights, particularly for women, uh, movements that have been particularly associated with feminism. So what we need to do now is to follow multiple paths uh, towards gender justice and in this way hopefully liberate the potential of all women. Thank you. No, I mean, it, 
part of the part of that thesis is summarized in the critique of, of domesticity, right, and which is part of in part the kind of uh, driving reaction of the of the second wave feminist movement. And I think that the feminist movement was absolutely correct to re to reject ascribed domesticity precisely because it's in the ascription of social roles, which in turn reflect the gender division of labor, that uh, inequality grows. But the but what we got in that analysis was a lopsided focus on 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 the sort of on the prescriptive um, um, sort of goal, which was a lopsided focus on entry into and full incorporation in men's world, in the men's side of the gender division of labor, at the expense of giving visibility and value to what had been historically associated with women. In what I'm calling for is for a, a sort of a rehabilitation of the arena that has been historically associated with women's inequality, which is to say the family and the gendered work that is provided in the family, and a social uh, decision to accord that work full value, not to assign it to women, but to re in full recognition of the fact that as society currently functions, it is mostly women who perform that, that kind of work. And because it is mostly women who perform that kind of work, to the extent that we do not recognize its social value, we simply replicate women's inequality. I, you know, in terms of how policies would be written, they would be written in gender neutral language, so it would be either gender who performed that work and, and so forth and so on. But I do think that we need to, um, we need to balance what has been a 30 year focus on um, have you know winning opportunities to have men's achievements, you know under our belts too. We need to balance that, which is an important focus. I wouldn't give that up, but we need to balance it with uh, you know sort of uh, an effort to say that the the side of the gender division of labor that doesn't look like it has any achievements at all because of the way we have discussed women's work uh, over these many you know eons. Uh, needs to be brought into visibility and, and brought in actively into political life. And we can borrow from the feminist language if the person was political to cross that public-private divide. <coughs> I don't know if that gets to what... Yeah. Uh, we're two years into a five-year and out uh, policy. Are we going to get where we need to go um, are we going to get where we need to go in terms of improving the current welfare policy? Um, we're certainly not going to get anywhere near what I'm talking about, but I don't think that means that we shouldn't have conversations that go beyond what is immediately politically plausible. Um, I mean, I'm a strong believer in the fact that you don't ever um, reach change unless you work at it for some period of time. In the meantime, though, I do think that there are a number of things that are going to have to be done legislatively, either at the state level or at the federal level, in order to avert the uh, massive destitution that is inevitable when the five-year limit hits um, folks who are currently enrolled in welfare. I mean, in some states, the absolute time limit has hit some people, like Connecticut and so forth, but um, over the kind of in terms of the national aggregate, you're right. It'll be 2002, and you know one can only hope that the economy is as healthy as it currently is uh, to absorb some of the folks who will simply be kicked out of, of the system altogether. I think that um, you know that there are all kinds of, of labor market policy initiatives that we can pursue. Uh, to try and make the transition less painful. We can try, for example, um, I, don't, I don't think that we can, certainly can't accomplish um, sort of winning welfare as a right in this period of time, but I think we might well have a chance at restoring the childcare entitlement for low-income families, that sort of thing. Um, we may be able to uh, kind of a long-term problem for women uh, as, as uh, people who leave the labor market for short periods or long periods of time because of uh, child raising and child bearing needs is how unemployment insurance is structured. And it 
you know, we may need to, to, and this may be possible strategically, to amend unemployment insurance legislation uh, to take account of the reasons women lose jobs or women leave the labor market for short periods of time, um, whether it's sexual harassment or loss of child care or pregnancy. Um, we need, you know, I mean, one of the reasons many women turn to, to welfare initially is because we don't have paid maternity policies. Um, so that's another, you know, within the framework of the work ethic, meaning the labor market work ethic, there are those sorts of things that we can undertake to try to attenuate some of the damage, but it's not going to solve the problem of the premises of the law and, and the fact that there will always be women whose, whose rights are pretty seriously in jeopardy and with those rights, um, the economic well-being of, of their families as well. Yes. In a way that makes sense. The first critique that I was offered, that I heard you say, was in terms of the racial differences that really make up a big part of what's going on here. And the women who united in Congress didn't have any investment in terms of women who look or appear to be like me because of who they care. They're, 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 they're not interested in helping black women, they're interested in promoting the quote. The, the female or whatever, feminist agenda, whatever that might be. But what it really says is that if you are like me, particularly in terms of social class, um, a level of education, and outlook on life, then I'll support it. But if you're different from me, then we're not going to have it. And I think part of the problem is with this guy's question really gets at it. You can't really expect to even have gender equality in terms of, of, of pay or work when you have in the community that's asking for it bifurcation that's really quite destructive in that you, it's, it's fascinating to me because you're one of the few people I've ever heard say this in public. So I just want to comment and make a compliment on that. But it's very scary to me because I think that um, this is just the sort of the iceberg. Because as resources become more and more scarce, and as more and more people will be harmed by the year 2002 by the Welfare Reform Act, um, you're going to see a very, very, very different and I sort of want you to comment on what you think that might be if, if, if the feminists don't get right here. It's a big and challenging question. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I'm very optimistic. I mean, but one of the reasons I say what I say in public is to try and sort of, you know, tweak the conscience of, of people who are situated variously in, in sort of, you know, broad coalition that theoretically cares about social justice, even though there are lots of divisions among us. And, and in terms of sort of indicting feminists, one of the things I do think it's important to, to point out is the, is the sort of the self-reflexiveness of the positions that um, have been taken, you know, which it's, you know, if you went up to many of these, if you went up to Donna Shalala or you went up to Barbara Boxer and said, you know, don't you support the the needs and claims of poor African American mothers, their answer would be yes. But when they think in policy terms, they think of their own experiences. And that's the problem is, you know, I think feminists have been too uh, literal about the personal is political. You know, truly exactly what we've lived in our lives is what it is that should dictate our politics. And that's no way to uh, engage in large struggles, which by nature um, are difficult for for social justice, because you need to build coalitions, and that's certainly no way to pursue um, equality for everyone. If, if if equality for everyone is your ostensible goal, now what's going to happen to feminists between now and the year 2002 is less clear to me. Um, you know that many feminists are working very very hard uh, to kind of improve circumstances within the welfare system as it currently exists, but the, the, um, they're not seeding on basics, you know, having to do with uh, child support or, or work requirements and, you know, the idea that any job is better than taking care of your own kids, you know, um, it remains a fairly constant um, theme. And I don't know the way out other than by sort of vigorous and relentless public discourse with 
um, with them and across the various divides on, on the issues that we have. It's certainly not a, a problem that's going to resolve itself. It's been a problem for 30 years. You know, it, the, the, the problem of, of sort of a racialized politics among women, certainly from if feminism is the, is the central issue to, to look at, has been there since the 1960s when the movement emerged. And if you look into the early decades of the 20th century, in the first wave of, of the women's movement, it was central present there too. You know, so in part what that shows is that, you know, obviously you know, gender doesn't, you know, a gender consciousness doesn't resolve uh, all questions of inequality any more than class consciousness resolves all questions of inequality. And, and it's self-consciousness of the, the conflicts among social locations and identities that is the real precursor to being able to build coalitions that can commonly uh, spell out, uh, you know, sort of objectives and, and work for work for social change. Yes. Uh, uh, for me, uh, the day that you strike uh, on the economic position of poor women are really quite disturbing. But I think the long run picture is worse than perhaps the industry. I'm not saying that uh, And I think that. Uh, the reason that not only because of this five-year time limit, but because of the fact that this 1996-98 period is a period of uh, peak prosperity, uh, peak mm -hmm. of the business cycle, and then the fact that we have a cross as large as unemployment. So as you then move away from the top of the business cycle, as the five-year limit Right, it's certainly in terms of the availability of jobs. Um, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's completely dependent, um, not completely, but a big part of it is dependent upon the, on the vigor of the um, economy. So you're absolutely correct um, on, on that score. Okay, yes. Um, I was not laying at the door of feminism um, all responsibility for welfare reform. My, and in fact, I mean, I started out saying that the, the most tempting thing to do is in fact talk about conservatives and talk about Southern politics and talk about the emergence of people like Charles Murray and uh, the Republican takeover and the contract with America and so forth that certainly um, fueled uh, the reforms until ultimately you had enactment of the, of the law in 1996. However, 
Um, the law, as it, as it was passed, was actually a democratic innovation. It was an innovation, it was Bill Clinton's policy that was put on the table upon his election, uh, upon his ascent into office in 1993. And um, it, was a, it was based upon a bipartisan consensus about what it was that was, why there was a welfare crisis. And uh, that bipartisan consensus centrally involved feminists. And the responsibility I am, I am uh, sort of uh, pinning on feminists is their capitulation to that consensus and failure to challenge it. Uh, and in their failure to challenge it, their failure therefore as the only really organized voice that was in a position to make a difference to not, they couldn't have stopped enactment, but they may well have been able to stop uh, Bill Clinton from signing the law. And if they had been able to stop Bill Clinton from signing the law, we would be in a different place today. Um, than we are, or poor single mothers would be in a different position today than they certainly are. And so there was a, an amount of leverage um, that they were in a position to, not that they generated the policy, but there, there was a leverage that they could have exerted, and there was uh, an intervention into the debate that they could have, um, that they could have devised that would have, even if Clinton signed the, the law, would have at least sort of sort of sowed the terrain for a broader discussion in the aftermath of that legislation. And that just, that never occurred. And part of my sort of purpose is to try and figure out what it is about, about sort of uh, uh, the views of feminists as they were articulated in congressional debates and by individual women across the country, letter to, letters to the editor. You know, I followed all this stuff and I was in it as someone who was trying to mobilize Folks, and time and time again, it was always, uh, it was always that basically any job is a good thing, and this sort of fundamental contempt for the child raising uh, uh, desires and obligations of mothers who are single and poor, um, and and that that's a problem. And as to your point about altruism, I'm not calling for altruism necessarily, what I am calling for is for feminists to live up to their own rhetoric. And the rhetoric of feminism has been sisterhood. Sisterhood is powerful. We are all together in this same boat fighting patriarchy, or whatever it is that we're fighting at any given moment. And that language of sisterhood, that claim to speak for uh, a sisterhood has never been relinquished by the women's movement, by anyone in it. Uh, and yet the actions of the people who are, are acting in politics as feminists, um, as well as, as, as women, has been to really sort of overlook and not even listen to uh, the voices of other women who are nominally, you know, supposed to be their sisters and part of the universe of politics that, that feminists mobilize to, to represent. So that's, that's the issue. Um, and I, you know, and I do think that, you know, in in ways that are far less direct, the movement of women into the workforce, the long-term sort of policy focus on labor market stuff, to the to the to the uh, exclusion of uh, family uh, concerns and so forth, has contributed and made it pot gave Republicans kind of a, a, a rhetorical tool. You know, they could talk about women deserving to be in the labor force or women ought to be in the labor force because now so many more women are. And when that is accomplished in the absence of sort of recognition of the, the double burdens that particularly women who are doing the two jobs themselves uh, face, I think, was a, a very serious um, uh, sort of deficit on the part of feminists and in the debate. And you know, you can't, you know, millions of feminists march, you know, to protect abortion rights, march against domestic violence, protested in the streets of Los Angeles and Chicago against the O.J. Simpson verdict, boycotted Larry Flint, People versus Larry Flint, so it couldn't even get you know, any sort of attention by uh, the Academy uh, uh, Awards folk and so forth. I mean, you know, feminists can do all kinds of things, and yet nobody marched in the streets for poor single mothers. You know, nobody did that kind of mobilization. Thank you, Dr. Mayor.